Um, this is an interview for the Purdue University Oral History Program. Today's date is August 14th, 2013. I'm interviewing by phone today a member of Purdue's class of 1963, Mr. Timothy Harmon. The interviewer is Tracy Grimm, Baron Hilton Archivist for Flight and Space Exploration at Purdue University Libraries Archives and Special Collections. Mr. Harmon, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today and for participating in our oral history program. I'd like to begin, Mr. Harmon, by asking you about your early years and your education. Um, could you tell us where you were born, um, where you grew up, and, and what the, a little bit about what that was like? All right. Um, my, uh, well, I probably should start out with my father, who was a Purdue graduate of 1928. Uh, hmm. He ended up working with uh, Goodyear, and uh, I was born in Gadsden, Alabama. Oh. Uh -huh. I spent most of my formative years in Akron, Ohio. My father worked for a rubber company and was the vice president of General Tire and Rubber Company. Uh, my roots are Hoosier. I, my, my father was a, is a Hoosier. My um, cousins, etc., are Hoosiers. I lived in Indiana for a, a couple of years in Marion, Indiana. Uh, that was uh, eighth grade and freshman year. Uh, so I've been exposed to Purdue because probably of my father, and uh, also uh, I have a Purdue legacy. My father graduated in 28. My brother graduated from Purdue in 58. And I, I graduated from Purdue in 63 in January. And uh, my son has his Ph.D. from Purdue in class of 93. Wow. So, so there... Uh, uh, it's a long legacy. Uh, several cousins and relatives are also Purdue graduates. Um, uh, my major, or I, I got, uh, let's say I was good in math and science in high school, or at least interested in it, and uh, by my senior year, I decided to become an aeronautical engineer. I looked at Ohio State, USC, Michigan, and Purdue, uh, because those schools had a what I understood to be a good aeronautical engineering program. Uh, but uh, Purdue uh, won out probably because uh, my father really uh, enjoyed his years at Purdue, and I was exposed to colleges at a pretty early age. Mm -hmm. um, I was a four-and-a-half-year student. Uh, I was a little bit deficient from high school in, uh, in math, in, uh, in Akron, uh, high schools were just starting to teach calculus in high school, and uh, my high school did not. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it took me uh, four and a half years to uh, graduate from Purdue because I had some deficiencies in both math and English. Mm -hmm. I, I graduated, uh, or my um, scholastic record, I, I'm a C or C plus student. Uh, I had 156 semester hours of uh, credit from Purdue, uh, and that's quite a, quite a bit. In those days, I think it took 140 or 145 semester units to graduate. Uh, when I graduated in 1963, uh, the space race was just beginning, and uh, aeronautical engineers were a desirable field to be in. I didn't realize that when I went into school, but I realized it looking back. I had 14 offers to, uh, with different companies uh, to uh, choose from, and actually I started at uh, Douglas, and, um, but uh, they had a, a major uh, contract loss, and so very shortly thereafter I began my career at uh, uh, North American uh, Rocket Eye. Wow, 14 offers, that's ama amazing. You, um, what, what um, if I could go back just a little bit, um, sure. when you were a senior in high school, um, I mean, did you, what made you um, decide that aeronautical engineering was really the, the area you wanted to go into? Was it the culture or the time or? Uh, the culture or the time. Well, I was very influenced uh, by uh, uh, Warner Von Braun, I had read uh, uh, some
some things that uh, he had uh, published either like in Collier's Magazine or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, so uh, that had some influence on it. Uh, I, uh, I thought rockets were kind of interesting. Uh, aeronautical engineering was close to that. Yeah. Um, but it, it, was, uh, it was a late decision. I don't think I was leaning towards uh, engineering even particularly until my senior year. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was an engineer, but really he was a manager by that time, and uh, uh, he, he wasn't, uh, uh, didn't really have an engineer's bent, in my opinion. He didn't know how to fix things very well. <laughs> that sort of stuff. He was a manager by then, and uh, maybe that was uh, the reason. Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, I uh, just uh, was pretty reasonable in math and science, and uh, engineering uh, fit the bill. Yeah. Uh, when we say I, ha I was a C-plus student, uh, I have to remember that in about night when I started at Purdue, this would have been like 58, the all-men's average at Purdue was under a C. Wow. And so uh, Purdue was a tough school. Yeah. Right? And um, uh, I, I liked Purdue because uh, it had uh, uh, processes, I guess, in place. In other words, they accepted a lot of people, and you could flunk out. Um, and uh, we were still uh, flunking students. All the way into my first semester, uh, junior year, you could still get washed out, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That didn't mean you were at the end of your career. It just meant that you had to drop down into something that was a little less rigorous mm -hmm. uh, uh, to graduate. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, oh, well, that's the end of whatever you're going to be. You might uh, might have taken something that was more business oriented or less math or science oriented. Right. Right. Uh, Purdue, when I uh, uh, became interested, uh, they run you through a battery of tests to see your proficiency in math and science and English, and that kind of then decides the track. If you're really uh, well-prepared high school-wise or exceptionally uh, uh, bright, uh, you could get through Purdue at that time in three years, uh, maybe even three, uh, three, three and a half years. If you were a little bit deficient, it, 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 they put you on a track that took you uh, four and a half years. Uh, or if you are way deficient, it, they could put you on a track that would maybe graduate you in five years. Mm -hmm. So they accommodated uh, the capability of the student, and I thought that was uh, very good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you have a particular memory from your time here in, at Purdue in engineering or, or just in general that stands out in your mind? Um, well, uh, that's interesting. I thought it was very well organized. Uh, uh, this is a lot of reflection. Yeah. Uh, in other words, um, as I um, stayed in the rocket business, I realized that some of the professors I had at Purdue were uh, pretty good. Uh, they understood the, uh, what we were doing. Uh, the names that stick out and that I would run into uh, with meeting uh, senior engineers at the company, uh, for instance, uh, many of them were familiar with or had had his textbook from Professor Bruin. Well, Pop Bruin was his name, and he was a structures professor and very good. Mm -hmm. Another one that was in there was uh, Professor Osborne. Now, he was in the mechanical engineering school, but uh, he was a rocket person, and uh, he was pretty inspiring. Also, uh, Professor Palmer, I, I can remember. And you'd run into these names uh, discussing technical issues, um, and, and uh, that made an impression that uh, you know, Purdue had a pretty first-rate education. Mm -hmm. uh, another professor was Professor Liston, and uh, affectionately known as Piston Liston. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's important. And I can also say uh, in reflection that uh, the company I work for, it's, uh, the first name is uh, North American, but it's really uh, Rocketdyne. Uh, we had a lot of graduates that were from Purdue, and, and they uh, interviewed uh, at Purdue and uh, made a lot of offers, and we had a lot of alumni, if you will, uh, where I worked. Mm-hmm. And that's also is impressive. Uh, they considered uh, Purdue one of the top ten schools to recruit at for engineers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how do you, um, what do you think were the m- most important lessons you graduated with from Purdue that you took into your, you know, your young career as an engineer? one to, to answer. What I'd have to say is uh, in, in just interacting with uh, different engineers as they came out of school, uh, Purdue uh, was a little more practical. Uh, it wasn't uh, uh, real high theoretical. Uh, they needed people that uh, were somewhat practical uh, for the rocket industry, uh, and uh, that's probably uh, the most important aspect. In other words, uh, you were relatively capable of doing uh, engineering work or understanding engineering work uh, when you graduated. You weren't so theoretical that, uh, uh, or so business-oriented. Uh, uh, you were more problem-solving oriented, and uh, Purdue prepared you for that. Right. Uh, much better than uh, some of the other schools that uh, I interacted with. Mm-hmm. Great, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I'm going to switch um, to ask you some questions about your career. Um, okay. Um, could you talk about your first job after graduating from Purdue in 1963? And I don't know if you want to um, talk about the very first job or jump to North American. I'll leave that up to you. Okay, I'll, I'll go to North America. And, uh, Douglas was a fine company, and I probably would have had similar experiences if I uh, if they hadn't lost a major contract. Right. Uh, but um, I started uh, at uh, North American or Rocketdyne, and um, I spent 42 years there in this uh, this particular industry, and and. Uh, what I'll, I'll say is uh, uh, this was an interesting time from the standpoint that uh, there was a space race, and, and I think that environment needs to be set. Yeah. In other words, uh, uh, and I don't have my history that well in mind, but I would say uh, something in the late 50s, so about 57, 58, somewhere in there, the Russians launched Sput- Sputnik. Yeah, 57. And, uh, that was a shock to the country and maybe a shock to the technical world at the time because uh, uh, the United States uh, felt that they were the leading technology in the world. And, and I can also remember our response to uh, the Sputnik launch was to try and launch uh, a um, propulsion system called Vanguard. And Vanguard, they had that on television. They lit that rocket off. It moved about four feet in the air and then exploded. Oh, right. So it was uh, then that we realized that uh, uh, we were behind. And you can go even farther than that. Uh, what was it? Uh, the Soviets in the, the early 60s uh, put a man in orbit. And, I mean, they put him there. Uh, for several orbits and that Mm -hmm. sort of thing. And what was the United States response? Well, Alan Shepard, he he was launched and he spent 15 minutes in (laughs) space. So uh, this was a a race and this was the early 60s and this is when I uh, graduated from uh, Purdue. So uh, there was uh, an environment that uh, we were behind and there was a space race and uh, Rocketdyne was uh, expanding at a fantastic pace. So I, I've come into Rocketdyne, and uh, in the first uh, week or two, uh, I am uh, mentored. Uh, might be the word, maybe not mentored.
entered, but at least uh, uh, learned uh, some of the ropes by a engineer who had six months more experience than I did at <laughs> time. And that went on for maybe two weeks, followed by you're on your own uh, to, for testing this particular rocket engine. <laughs> which then uh, I proceeded to do uh, and, you know, mentored other engineers and that sort of thing. Right. So within two weeks, uh, I had the responsibility of testing. Now, testing a rocket in those days uh, was test to failure, learn from it, and do it all over again until <laughs> you got the thing to work. We did blow things up in those days and uh, blew them up quite frequently. <laughs> so... Um, I, I have to say I was a development engineer, and uh, uh, in my course of career at Rocketdyne, I probably uh, helped develop um, 10, 15 different rocket propulsion systems. So I can honestly say that I am a rocket scientist. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Uh, um, I was reading something you wrote about those first uh, months at Rocketdyne, and I think you wrote something like, you know, you were hired and um, within like three months, there were guys who you'd get serial numbers who had a, th a serial number, a thousand numbers higher than yours. It just kind of illustrated to me how quickly everything was escalating at that period when we were during the space race and trying to catch up. Yes, that, that's really true. Uh, Rocket and I don't, have, I don't uh, even know when I hired in how, how large we were. Uh, but um, I would guess maybe 10,000 people, and by the time the Apollo program peaked as far as rocket propulsion, we were up upwards of 25 to 30,000 people. So the the growth in a in say a five year period was absolutely astronomical. It really was. Yeah. So your learning curve you had to you had to learn quickly. Uh, to yes, you did. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah. It was a, I think it was a good environment. Uh, there's pluses and minuses to that because uh, with the, that kind of rapid growth, uh, we had huge turnover as far as uh, they weren't leaving the company. They were just being promoted or moved to different areas, and so you had a lot of different bosses yeah. or senior people, uh, and it was constantly shifting. Uh, but you were also given a job to do, and so you – really didn't, uh, and they let you do it, so you really didn't have that problem of, oh, uh, the, the politics was more get the job done than uh, the personalities. Right, right. Could you um, talk a little bit specifically about the two um, Apollo um, projects you worked on, the, the ascent rocket, the lunar ascent rocket, and the, and the command module? Okay, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, uh, the command, I'm going to start with the oldest, and it'll be the briefest. Uh, the oldest was the, um, or let's say my first program, was the um, reaction control rockets for the Apollo command vehicle. Now, uh, the thing about that is this is a small rocket engine. This, this produced maybe, uh, nine, well, I can tell you exactly, 93 pounds thrust. So it's just little. It probably didn't even stand, golly, maybe a foot high. Uh, it was a blady cool. By that, it means it just sort of like uh, uh, charred uh, cooling. It was buried in the command module, and the whole thing was to keep the command module heat shield oriented uh, correctly so that you could re-enter the Earth. Uh, the challenge was that uh, our previous experience was with Gemini and, uh, ooh, forgotten what was ahead of that. At any rate, it doesn't matter. Mer Mercury? Mercury, yeah. thank you. Uh, those were uh, smaller and slower. Um, going to the moon and coming back, the uh, command module was traveling uh, like 25,000 miles an hour when it runs into the atmosphere. So the engine had, and, um, uh, the little rocket engine had to keep the heat shield in the correct orientation so that you didn't uh, burn up the astronauts. Right. Um, and uh, as such, this was a, a development program uh, to make this engine very reliable, and uh, it was a very important aspect, and it was the last rockets to fire uh, to bring the astronauts home. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the, it was very interesting, the Apollo, uh, some of the logic that went through it. Uh, they tended to, to overkill things and do with redundancy. So uh, you need six rockets, small RCS, uh, reaction control rockets, to control this uh, command module. But uh, where they could, they wanted it redundant. So they put 12 of these on in two separate systems in case one didn't work, uh, the other one uh, would. Hmm. And uh, that was a keystone of almost every uh, part of the Apollo program to have redundancy. Uh, The other thing that really struck me when we were being uh, briefed on how they were going to use these uh, reaction control engines was uh, they had a switch that activated uh, all the reaction control systems. And there was a great deal of worry that this switch would um, not uh, activate the rocket engines. In other words, it would electrically um, turn the things on. And uh, they would, uh, they were worried uh, in testing the vehicle that they would exercise this switch to verify that it worked to the point that they had used up all the cycles the switch could take. And uh, so uh, they finally came to the conclusion that uh, once the vehicle was built, that that switch would be used once to check out in the, in the, the vehicle stack, and the next time it would be to activate it. They just didn't want to even wear out the switch. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. that was uh, some of the care they had. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problems we had with uh, this little rocket engine was it was a different contractor. Jim and I was a McDonnell Douglas or McDonald uh, vehicle, and Apollo was um, uh, North American. And as soon as you change contractors, the next guy wants to tweak, sure. improve the rocket. And uh, they s- decided to do that, and that just added to the expense. And they, I guess, felt that they were making improvements, but it was always kind of a trade-off. Were they really making improvements, or were they just uh, uh, spending money? Mm-hmm. And you, you, you really... Uh, begin to to learn that uh, you're better off uh, using a legacy um, uh, hardware uh, rather than making improvements. In other words, once it works, you stop uh, improving things. And that's probably one of the biggest lessons that you learn uh, in any program is that uh, there is a point where you do need to get fire the engineers, if you will, and get (laughs) on with the job. (laughs) Right. uh, the um, oh, another aspect of uh, uh, Rocket Night was that they really encouraged you to get educated. So even during all these um, space race activities, uh, uh, I was encouraged to get a master's, and I did. I got a master's in mechanical engineering from USC, and uh, then encouraged to get an MBA, which I got uh, also from Pepperdine. Um, Wow. The second program that I worked on, and it's probably the most uh, interesting program uh, and one I'm proudest of, was the uh, Lunar Ascent uh, engine. Now, this engine is the engine that took the astronauts off the moon. Mm-hmm. And um, they, uh, the whole architecture, like I said, of the Apollo was to have redundancy. Well, it turns out to have redundancy on every engine was pretty well uh, managed all the way through the descent to the moon. In other words, a liftoff, if a boost, uh, it had multiple engines, and if you lost a, a booster engine one, uh, you could probably still make orbit. And if you lost the, in the second stage an engine or two, you could still make orbit, etc. But when they got to the moon, uh, they could. Uh, they had an engine for lunar landing, the descent engine, and its backup was the ascent engine. However, the weight of backing up the ascent engine was just too much, so it was an engine that did not have a backup. There was no backup for the ascent off the moon. The the rationale to do that, or uh, the result of that, meant that the engine going to 
lift the astronauts off the moon had to be super reliable. Mm -hmm. And they did that by, A, simplifying it, the requirements, and B, uh, even within the engine, uh, making it uh, robust, I guess is the best word to say. Mm -hmm. Now, the, so here is um, an engine that has to, has to work. There isn't a second chance. And um, we did not, we, uh, when I say we, Rocketdyne did not have this contract. This contract was uh, to Bell Aircraft, mm -hmm. and they were using a derivative of a, a rocket they had developed called the Agena, and modifying it to be the liftoff engine. Now, uh, they started that effort, I think, oh, golly, 63, 64, something like that. Um, and uh, the whole idea of the Apollo was to get to the moon before the end of the century of uh, 1970. Uh, it turned out by 1967 that uh, Bell was having problems with their engine. And it, it became apparent to NASA that this was impacting the schedule. In other words, uh, there were issues with this engine and they were significant issues. A uh, major one was combustion instability. Mm -hmm. And combustion instability is uh, a phenomenon that uh, was uh, very difficult in the 60s. Many rocket engines had the problem, um, and they would cause, uh, let's just call it a rapid disassembly of a rocket. <laughs> and um, unplanned, and Bell had problems with their engine. There were other issues too, uh, erosion issues and things like that, but the primary uh, issue uh, that they were having, and this is also with NASA uh, recognizing that, was that combustion instability was a significant issue with this engine. So in 67, the, uh, Bell was not even in a position to start what we would call qualification tests to verify that this engine could be used in a man-rated system. Mm -hmm. And uh, they started a backup uh, position, which uh, Rocketdyne uh, won to start a independent program to solve these issues. And I was assigned to this program, uh, and uh, it was probably one of the most interesting periods in my career. Um, the, um, the program, uh, what Rocketdyne did is uh, offer uh, an engine that had uh, multiple uh, ideas for uh, controlling combustion instability. Uh, one of the things you do, combustion instability is where uh, the um, vibration of the combustion process uh, gets in tune with uh, burning. And so, it, in other words, uh, one part of the uh, combustion process uh, gets really uh, fast and or starts to cycle at a certain frequency, I guess is a better way to say it. And, uh, mm -hmm. and by that, I mean a very high frequency. Uh, this causes uh, uh, the combustion process to get in sync with this frequency and it will explode. Mm -hmm. um, we put baffles in to change the frequency of combustion so that it would uh, not be an issue. Uh, we also uh, put in what is called acoustic cavities and uh, this is where you really get kind of technical. Acoustic cavities are a way of taking a certain frequency and nullifying it, <laughs> okay, with a Helmholtz resonator. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit like an organ pipe, and if you do that, mm -hmm. you can disrupt combustion instability and make things smooth. Mm -hmm. um, this was the area of test that uh, I probably spent most of my time, and um, we had to prove uh, that we were stable. Now, how do you do that? Well, you purposely cause an explosion to occur when you start the engine and see if the engine will naturally damp out the disturbance. Uh, bottom line is this is a relatively small engine.
probably uh, five feet tall. It had 3,500 pounds thrust, which uh, was all that was needed to take an uh, astronaut off the moon. And uh, so uh, it, it's not a large engine, but it's an important one. Mm -hmm. the, uh, we started that uh, program in, oh golly, the summer of 67. Uh, Rocketdyne and NASA was very concerned and they were more interested in uh, schedule speed, uh, in other words, get the job done so that they could uh, get to the moon by uh, the end of the uh, decade. And uh, so everything was uh, really schedule driven. Now I'm not that experienced an engineer, I'm four, five, six years into the rocket business. And uh, to get schedule, they sort of said to every engineer working on the program that if you can improve schedule, uh, and usually that meant working weekends, mm -hmm. uh, you, were, you had the power to say, uh, we can work. Now, the, so here I am, a five-year veteran, if you will, and if I could... Uh, perform a test or get the hardware ready to run a test uh, uh, on a weekend, uh, I, could, uh, I could order that to be done, and this was expensive. Yeah. Uh, our test uh, crews were 30 people per uh, shift. We ran three shifts. We were running around the clock. We ran uh, Saturdays almost consistently, sometimes Sunday. and. Um, that was just my call, and I didn't call the boss and say I'm going to uh, uh, need to authorize overtime. I just was permitted to authorize overtime, and that's the way it went. That was very effective. We did not abuse that, and uh, but we uh, pretty much worked around the clock. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, uh, we had pr eventually proved that we understood combustion instability to NASA's satisfaction within essentially nine months, we had taken over the program that uh, Bell had been working on for probably four or five years and had not had success. So that was probably the highlight of my career. I will further say that um, my brother, who graduated from Purdue at 58, was a friend of Neil Armstrong. They were both in the same fraternity. Oh. And uh, I met Neil, I was in, my brother was quite a bit older than I was, and uh, I met Neil Armstrong when Quinn and Neil came by our house on the way to somewhere uh, <laughs> as college students. So I guess I can say I met Neil Armstrong before he was an astronaut. <laughs> I don't say that I, uh, you know, was a friend of Neil Armstrong, but I knew and had met him, knew what he looked like and that sort of thing. And it kind of made the uh, ascent engine a personal thing that uh, I was uh, assisting uh, Neil Armstrong getting off the moon. Mm -hmm. And that was quite a thrill for me. Yeah. Uh, the other foible, uh, if you will, uh, uh, we were raising a family. I had uh, two children at that time. Uh, but... Uh, we didn't have television in our house. We had sold our television when our, uh, in 65 and did not have a television for the next, oh, I don't know, 20 years in our household. So when it came time for the astronauts to uh, go to the moon and uh, have history, uh, we did not have the means to watch it on television and we uh, had to go to a motel <laughs> and, and mm -hmm. get a television to watch uh, <laughs> the astronauts land on the moon and take off. It's kind of a foible. <laughs> well, I bet the kids like that, though. They always like to go to a hotel, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, it made it memorable. Yeah. Well, I'm going to come back to that because I have a question uh, for yes. you related to that. But first, I, I wanted to ask you about... Um, you know, that short period of time that you had to get this done, you know, um, th this engine, what was the company culture like? What um, were there, I mean, I, I read that you, you talked about the teamwork and that things were not always done that way up to that point. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that was, uh, that was an interesting uh, 
interesting aspect. And, and uh, probably uh, early Rocketdyne, uh, it was a uh, top-down operation. Uh, the managers told you which way to go, uh, what they'd like done, and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, they recognized that uh, the uh, business uh, architecture that they were using to uh, run a program uh, was cumbersome. Uh, we had a uh, huge machine shop, huge quality control, uh, huge inspection organizations, and uh, they were not always in tune with the particular goal uh, that uh, this program was going to require. In other words, we had to get the job done in a very short period of time. Uh, Developing a rocket engine from scratch is a uh, several-year effort, and when when a rocket engine is uh, used for a man-rated application, they uh, they NASA, the government, and everything uh, are very concerned, and uh, they make the uh, qualification or the go-ahead for producing and using an engine very stringent. They want to have it very well proven. So the, uh, to do that, that all takes time. Now, Rocketdyne uh, recognized that this wasn't going to, uh, this had to be a different approach to because of the schedule constraints. And that when, they, when I say recognize, this is uh, from the president on down, uh, Rocketdyne uh, was to get the job done. Uh, NASA was, uh, and NASA had, had recognized that they were in serious trouble, and mm -hmm. they were very cooperative as well. So not only was our company in tune with the schedule issues, NASA was in tune with it, and so was the vehicle contractor, which was uh, Grumman uh, Aircraft. Uh, the lunar module was built by Grumman Aircraft. Mm -hmm. So the environment was uh, we had to get this job done and done quickly. So at the rocket eye level, that meant putting everybody that was going to be involved uh, in the program uh, on the program. And so we had quality engineers, we had inspection, and we had manufacturing, we had Grumman, we had NASA, and we were all essentially in the same building, same area, uh, but we did not have uh, a massive amount of people because you, you, if you get too many people, you start uh, stumbling all over yourself. Right. Responsibility was pushed down pretty low, but uh, uh, the coordination was uh, something to behold, and I, basically, and it was kind of fun uh, to watch, mm -hmm. um, management or the senior people uh, Eight o'clock every morning, there was a 15-minute stand-up meeting, and it literally was a stand-up meeting. Uh, it, offices in those days were not very large. I don't know, uh, golly, I'm trying to think of a size of a room, and uh, 15 by 10 feet, maybe something like that. And um, they would have the stand-up meeting in the program manager's uh, office. And it was like uh, those cartoons you see that uh, how many people you could stuff in a Volkswagen. <laughs> and uh, that went on for 15 minutes. And basically, uh, in that 15 minutes, you reviewed what you did yesterday. You reviewed what you planned to do today and what you were going to do tomorrow. And then it broke up, and that's where it all uh, uh, went from there. And uh, so... Uh, Having all those folks together um, helped from the situation that uh, some of the uh, design features that you might uh, want to put in uh, the, the rocket engine, uh, welding, uh, drilled holes, this sort of thing, if you got uh, too uh, elegant, and I'll say elegant in quotes, uh, you were asking the machine shop to do something that would take forever to do. Mm. And uh, they would point that out, and you would say, oh, you're probably right, that 
wasn't the brightest idea. We didn't need to get that tricky. Mm -hmm. Now, um, again, it, it, this is a round-the-clock operation. So manufacturing is working three shifts. Uh, the test area is working three shifts. Uh, I mentioned I was in charge of uh, stability testing. Uh, I was the uh, primary uh, development engineer. I had uh, some other people under me to help testing, and we uh, we worked very hard, closely with a, a test organization. But uh, the point is that uh, it was it was cooperative, and uh, uh, we managed to uh, get the job done. Now, being around the clock, one of our issues that showed up late was uh, we had uh, a weld uh, on the injector that uh, uh, fatigue cracked, and uh, we didn't find this out right away. We found this out in inspection, and uh, we thought, what in the world uh, did we do wrong? Because uh, we had the manufacturing process fairly uh, uh, routine, and uh, we just didn't understand why this was happening, and so uh, I was put on to <laughs> find out why this was happening. <laughs> and um, in examining uh, the welds under real high magnification from the shop, we, had, we just took every injector that was being made in the shop and we examined the welds, and uh, I noticed a slight difference in the location of where the weld was put down on the injector. And I thought, well, that's, that's kind of unusual. It wasn't real obvious. You couldn't just look at it. You had to look at it under magnification. And then uh, we started backtracking, well, this weld isn't quite right, and this weld is right. And what's the difference? Well, we found out that there's, uh, in manufacturing, uh, when you give them a drawing or uh, instructions on how to make it, uh, there's still a setup uh, art to putting things together so you can perform the operation. Well, we found uh, not every time, but the uh, second shift manufacturing person setting up the welding was not as careful or is not as good, probably uh, just uh, and not always bad. In other words, uh, many of his uh, welds were just satisfactory, but occasionally one wasn't quite as good as the other. And it was only the second shift welds that uh, sometimes fell out of uh, what we needed. And so uh, we eliminated the second shift. Now we did not, I mean the, the uh, mechanics or the uh, machine operators, uh, we did not tell this guy you weren't any good. We just moved him to a different uh, program, uh, and he never did realize mm -hmm. that uh, he, he was causing the problem. I, I think it was he was just just not quite as proficient in welding uh, or welding setup because it was a uh, machine operated weld mm -hmm. uh, as the day shift guy. Uh, but that did cure it, and I wrote a specification that could identify. Uh, weld the subtleties of the welds in a manner that uh, uh, manufacturing could then uh, verify that all the welds of the, for the injector that left the plant were acceptable and would not crack. That was a major breakthrough. I was very proud of that effort. Wow. And it just kind of illustrates how the program, it just did, um, required excellence on, on everyone's part. Yes, it did. Yeah. Um, I guess I want to ask you um, back to uh, the the hotel where you had to uh, to, to watch the the landing and uh, the mission on TV. What what do you remember most about um, that July about the mission Apollo Eleven? What were your feelings or or yeah? Where did you watch it and what what were you thinking? Okay, well I can tell you that it, uh, that uh, there's a, there's a couple things there that. Uh, really pleased me. Um, uh, one of the, the things was uh, we had uh, separate test areas. Uh, the manufactured production engines that went into the vehicle uh, was a test area, uh, but it wasn't the one I used for stability testing. However, uh, uh, we did switch back and forth because uh, uh, if, uh, if the production test site was uh, ready to test and I was available, I 
acceptable to go in the Apollo vehicle. And I uh, looked up the engines that I helped calibrate, if you will, or verify they were ready. And one of the engines that uh, I verified was the engine that went in the lunar module for uh, Neil Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Well, that was kind of exciting. So mm -hmm. um, the other aspect was uh, we certainly followed uh, the whole mission uh, of Neil from liftoff uh, through uh, uh, the moon, and uh, part of the reason is Rocketdyne had a major uh, uh, propulsion. Uh, we built the engines for the booster, the second stage, the third stage, and the lunar module. So, mm -hmm. in fact, I'm trying to, I don't know whether I can tell you exactly. I'm looking here as we're standing now. I don't, uh, I don't know the number of engines. But we had a lot of engines on there. Let's see, 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 12. So we had 30, 30 plus engines on the Apollo uh, program. So Rocket 9 was uh, involved in almost all phases of the uh, lunar uh, Apollo program. And by that I mean we had people at NASA or at Houston or at in Florida, that type of thing, uh, supporting uh, this. So we would get information about how things were going, if you will, uh, all the way. Mm -hmm. Now, when it came time and we knew when uh, uh, the landing was going to take place, and I don't even remember what day of the week it was, uh, I was at Rocketdyne, but uh, this is history. And like I said, we didn't have television, so uh, uh, we uh, drove uh, to just a, a, a motel uh, around Santa Barbara somewhere and uh, uh, took a room and uh, watched the whole thing. So we, we watched history, and mm -hmm. uh, it was really a, a thrilling thing. Uh, very comfortable with the engine that uh, it was going to do its thing. Uh, so you weren't nervous? <laughs> Oh yeah, very nervous, but <laughs> not uh, not so much that our engine wouldn't work. Uh, but there, that that whole that whole vehicle was uh, uh, something. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. you know, you they only needed an on-off switch. Uh, the engine itself uh, used what we call hypergolic propellants, and that means that you mix the two propellants together, and they'll spontaneously light. Now that's that's good news and bad news, but uh, right. so you didn't need a, an ignition system. You didn't need a match to get it going, and that was that was an important thing. Now the propellants uh, themselves are nasty. Uh, you you uh, you're you're playing with some stuff that's uh, very volatile, and uh, the environment is is, is uh, nasty. Uh, mm -hmm. The moon is not a uh, friendly place. And uh, so we had uh, taken all that stuff into account. Uh, we realized actually uh, fairly early in the program that the propellants uh, could see a temperature uh, low enough uh, to freeze or turn into slush. So we had to change the propellants slightly so that they would not uh, do that uh, when exposed to the environment and the moon, things like that. So there were mm -hmm. a lot of subtleties. And, uh, uh, so it was a real challenge, and the vehicle itself is just uh, something to behold in that uh, they really had weight problems. Uh, the lunar module itself was, uh, was a masterpiece of uh, engineering, but uh, they, uh, for instance, uh, didn't have uh, seats in the uh, lunar module. Uh, they couldn't afford the weight of a seat. The astronauts stood, and they were essentially harnessed in like a parachute, mm -hmm. and uh, they stood uh, because uh, they just couldn't afford the, the weight of uh, uh, seats. Uh, and the, the vehicle, they made a lot of efforts to keep the weight down. So it was a, it was a fragile and yet elegant machine that uh, did its job, but absolutely fascinating uh, to, to, to understand and know. Mm -hmm. I, I read that once you, you got the engine uh, set, you had to shave some weight off of it. Oh, that was another, yeah, that was another fun uh, <laughs> activity. Uh, uh, by 
fun, I say, is really interesting. Uh, again, uh, once the, the, the Armstrong uh, uh, could get there or improve the whole architecture, then they would like, uh, NASA would like to have brought home uh, more uh, lunar rocks. Well, if you can lighten up the vehicle, uh, you can add more rocks <laughs> to bring home. And our engine, uh, oh golly, gee, I don't even remember what it weighed, um, 200 pounds, something like that. And um, so they, they, NASA said, why, why don't you look at making the uh, uh, engine lighter? Every pound that we take off of the engine is another pound that the astronauts can bring back. And uh, so we took a look at. Uh, we had by then tested quite a few engines, and we realized that maybe we were being a little conservative with the thickness of uh, the material in the Bell nozzle, and uh, we should be able to recontour the Bell nozzle, taking some material out, and also uh, improving the performance of the nozzle. Uh, Rock and I had some uh, some people that. Uh, we could uh, count on. Uh, Dr. Rao, which is probably not a name people will know, but Dr. Rao uh, worked at Rocketdyne. I worked with him, very interesting, eccentric person, brilliant mathematician. And he, uh, he realized that you can change the contour of a rocket engine nozzle and uh, do it in a certain manner and you get increased performance and reduced length and uh, reduced weight. And with his uh, assistance, uh, we recontoured that nozzle, improved the performance of the rocket. And I was uh, put in charge of that program, did the testing, uh, helped uh, verify that it could be done and uh, not uh, degrade uh, the reliability of the engine. And we knocked off uh, 10, 15 percent of the weight, so 200 pounds, uh, yeah, about 30 pounds of weight. Uh, uh, we were able to take out of that engine, and that's 30 pounds more rocks that they could bring back from the moon. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's pretty. Uh, hopefully, you had enough time to work on that, but I, I doubt it wasn't much time. <laughs> yeah, you, we did. It, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't like you had to do over the whole program. When you're just working with a nozzle, you're not yeah. messing up uh, the combustion stability or anything like right. that. Right. So it was. Uh, it was I should also comment on the combustion instability problem. Uh, we uh, put in what what was called acoustic cavities, and that was. Uh, Rock and I had another philosophy, and uh, I think it's a good one, and uh, we pretty much followed. One of the things is if uh, uh, you know, once it once we've proven it works, uh, we try not to change things. But occasionally we would be testing a rocket engine, and uh, for some reason it uh, performance wasn't quite right. Now this isn't the the lunar module program. This is another program, but we try and take lessons from other programs as well. Mm -hmm. And and. Uh, even though this didn't happen all the time, this one engine that we were, it was an advanced program engine at any rate, it was not, occasionally it wouldn't work, but uh, it wasn't destructive, it didn't blow up or anything, so some people said, well, heck, yeah, we'll just live with it. But the management at Rocket Knight said, no, we got to understand that. And uh, even though um, uh, it didn't uh, destruct or anything, we still got to understand why it wasn't working the way it should every and that led to this, this acoustic cavity approach that we installed to uh, aid combustion stability. Uh, later, or uh, eventually, the uh, understanding was that it, uh, we were damping out uh, a particular frequency that uh, was causing the instability. And we actually uh, proved it on a one series of tests where we took and literally plugged up the acoustic cavity feature on one particular um, injector. And the first time we fired that injector up and lit off a, um, a bomb to cause instability, 
it really went unstable and uh, proved that this was one of the key features. And uh, so that was incredibly satisfying that uh, while uh, we uh, were maybe didn't quite have all the theory in place, uh, we did have uh, an elegant solution to a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how, how did your experience working on, this pro on the Apollo program shape your career? Uh, oh, that's an interesting one. I, uh, because I, Rocket 9 had what you call development engineers or project engineers or system engineers. And uh, so that uh, was where I essentially spent my career. And what that meant was that I would take uh, an engine uh, design and bring it up to a position where it could be put into production. And uh, so my career, uh, since the uh, uh, lunar module, uh, essentially was development uh, of different uh, products. And uh, I stayed kind of in that mode, uh, just getting more senior or older, but uh, it really did influence the way I worked. And, and it, uh, it varied. In other words, uh, I went from uh, rockets for a while to uh, uh, combustion processes, uh, literally uh, coal combustion. Uh, in other words, uh, burning coal in a way that uh, was less polluting mm -hmm. and, uh, or burning coal in a way that you could get uh, literally uh, burn a coal in a rocket type combustion process where you could get uh, speed stocks like acetylene or some other chemicals that uh, were made from oil. Uh, this was a result of the um, oil embargo and the United States was looking into ways to get uh, feed stocks for various chemical processes uh, without using oil, using coal or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I also uh, helped develop processes uh, uh, or uh, equipment uh, for nuclear reactors. So I, I uh, spent a lot of time in uh, different disciplines uh, from nuclear. Uh, basically, I say I've been a combustion person from uh, buffalo chips to uh, rocket science. And, <laughs> uh, I had a career that... Uh, in developing different things uh, that basically uh, evolved from uh, the Apollo program. And uh, uh, it formed my career, and uh, I spent a lot of time uh, in what we would call advanced programs, future rockets that might be used uh, or developed. And so uh, it was a very satisfying career. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts about the, the future of, of aerospace engineering or the future of um, space exploration? Do you have any thoughts? Oh, yes. And it's uh, uh, Rocket 9 uh, has fallen in, uh, in uh, prestige, I think, uh, but maybe it, uh, it deserved it because uh, it wasn't uh, uh, mobile enough to realize the, the market has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, NASA, to me, has not uh, been uh, really um, seeing the future very well. I worked on a couple of advanced programs that uh, NASA was sponsoring. One was called the X-33 and other things, and the architecture that NASA was proposing was uh, so complex or so uh, pushing uh, technology that uh, it just wasn't going to work. And what I have seen is uh, private industry like SpaceX and um, Blue, Blue something. Oh, yeah. I can't think of it either. At oh. uh, any rate, uh, mm. those uh, more um, entrepreneurial uh, companies, are SpaceX, are coming online. And uh, actually, I know a lot of rocket dying engineers that have gone to these companies uh, and so the, the the aeronautical area both airplane and propulsion uh, is, is 
alive and well, and, uh, but it has changed, and maybe uh, uh, that was good. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sad that uh, Rockadine now is, uh, well, it went from Boeing to Pratt & Whitney, and now it's uh, Aerojet, Rockadine. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's attempting to adapt, but it's been a little slow in doing that. That's really uh, 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 probably more uh, we didn't have the far-sighted uh, management to realize that uh, we needed to be a little different than we were. We stayed with the model of uh, government and NASA sponsorship or uh, government and Air Force sponsorship when uh, we needed to be thinking a little more commercially. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my opinion, but uh, it's more I don't think uh, – uh, aeronautical uh, engineering is uh, is a, a past thing. I think there's still a, a big demand for the skill sets that uh, we have, and uh, I think uh, Purdue does a pretty darn good job uh, developing engineers that uh, would be uh, good in this field. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, sure. I, I, I know a couple of seniors last year who went off to work at SpaceX uh, this uh -huh. year. So, yeah, the, they're out there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm down to my last question that I have for you, which is, um, is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you think I should have? <laughs> <laughs> I probably uh, might, uh, that's a really good question, and I don't know, I'll probably say, oh, why did I say that, or why didn't I say that? Uh, I don't know if I've described uh, the technical aspects that we uh, went through. Uh, I kind of gave a, a gloss of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I've really adequately described the space race, uh, because it was a significant space race. Uh, I have seen, oh, in fact, uh, I, I was on a tour in Russia, and I had uh, uh, went to uh, Star City and saw uh, uh, and talked with some of the Russian competition, if you will, uh, of the old timers. Uh, very much enjoyed that. Uh, they, uh, they did do wonderful work. I, uh, they took things uh, in different directions. I've seen some of the rocket engines uh, that the Russians developed uh, because uh, we thought that uh, we might learn from them. We went down slightly different paths, uh, probably both got there the same, same spot. But mm -hmm. competition was, was big, it was tough, uh, it was a different environment, uh, and the environment that we have now is a little less urgent. Uh, yeah. It's more commercial. Uh, can you do it in a, in a commercial environment and make money? Right. Uh, we had an environment where uh, it was schedule driven and uh, money was secondary. Uh, but uh, while while I make that statement, uh, they probably got pretty good bang for their buck because uh, uh, in the lunar module, for instance, while we spent money at a record pace on that program, we only did it for a couple of years and uh, produced a product that got the job done, and uh, uh, if you'd have had a, just a standard development program, we'd have probably spent uh, the same or more money over a longer period of time. So it, right. it's, uh, it'd be an interesting case study to know whether uh, was money well spent uh, uh, or was wasted, I don't know. No, oh, I, I, I'm sure it was well spent. <laughs> um, um, I, I guess that, that that's that's the last question I have, and it's been really a pleasure to talk with you, Mr. Harmon. Um, oh, well, thank you. And um, I, I I look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you on campus sometime, and maybe we could do a part two and get more technical. I'll have a I'll get an Aero student to come in and help me. <laughs> I would like that. Uh, it's, it's just we don't travel that direction anymore. Uh, yeah. I did uh, pick up, you know, uh, with uh, when my son was there, we were we were back more often. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I have pretty big or did in the past connections with Purdue. Even the alumni secretary uh, Joe Rudolph was. Uh, uh, 
through marriage uh, related to I knew him and uh, interacted with uh, the Rudolphs a lot. But uh, uh, it just doesn't seem like I, I get back in that area at all anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, th thank you.